did you watch any of the long rambling discourse between billionaires Elon Musk and Donald Trump? No, I didn't either. But thankfully, and weirdly, Pat Joyce did. So we look at that developing right wing phalanx and what it could mean for the rest of the world. Obviously, so dangerous in terms of uh, Twitter. But also, do we leave Twitter as a platform? Do we not buy Tesla cars? What reaction should there be to Elon Musk? Um, and of course, his attack on Hamza Yusuf and the ongoing demand that people should get out and express solidarity against the far right rally, whether it materialises or not on September the 7th. So we look at all of that. Uh, we look also at the news today that there's going to be a massive investment of a new interconnector between Scotland and England, which will largely export our renewable energy south. Is it a cause for celebration that finally some investment in hardware is happening or are we just losing our lecky? Those are the headlines. Now for the podcast. Hi, Joms, and welcome to this week's Leslie Riddick podcast. And back in the day in our newsroom set up at uh, Fife College, we had a, I was suppose it was a kind of a tongue-in-cheek poster on the wall that said, a journalist, definition, someone who never admits that nothing has actually happened. <laughs> and I thought that was particularly pertinent, to, given the, uh, the amount of tension, and rightly so, that we paid to the riots in England and Northern Ireland uh, last week, that the fact that no riots had taken place in, in Scotland. And the article that you wrote, Leslie, which was, uh, I've got some very interesting comments on, on that, which you spoke about the necessity to listen to the refugee and uh, migrant community in Scotland and New Scots, and to show solidarity by actually attending these rallies to counteract these so-called protests that were planned in Glasgow and elsewhere throughout Scotland. Well, yes. I mean, I was talking specifically about the September the 7th one that yeah. has, you know, has got permission uh, to have a protest. Um, you, you know, the ones that were rumoured to be occurring last weekend, and I think people are still a little bit alert and wondering what's going on. It doesn't look like many, any of them pitched up. Um, you'd have to say the, the day I was writing that, it was Wednesday of last week, um, that evening was the evening that 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 English communities came out big style, progressives, if you like, anti-racists and just occupied the space. Um, Brighton, um, trying to think where, where was the biggest one? Walthamstow in London was a big yeah. one. And fabulous. You know, that they so so that and and the the fact of quite a lot of publicity given to the three guys that were actually um, jailed that day. Um, who strangely enough voted um, voted pleaded guilty, which is why their their yes. case could be processed so quickly. But still, um, that you know that seems you, you do wonder if these guys have got the you know the the kind of racist guys who are pitching up the far right have got much of a backbone on this, and that's not meant as provocation or who thinks they're hard enough. But strangely, as soon as that kind of you know counter feeling began to demonstrate itself, um, they didn't pitch up. Now who knows? Uh, what will happen on se September the 7th. Uh, whether these guys will pitch up, I don't know. But th the point is that um, solidarity is a really important thing because having spent some time trying to find people uh, from the networks who were part of the Kenmuir Street mobilisation in 2021, um, we've spoken about this many times. I'm sure if you listen to the podcast, you don't need a long summary of it. But uh, two men who'd been lifted, who have actually had spent years, I think even a decade waiting um, to get permission to leave, to, to remain formally from the Home Office. Uh, a chef, Sumit Sedef, and a mechanic, Laksar Lakver Singh. Those two guys, their Sikhs, were picked up, uh, detained in an early morning raid. And as we all know, uh, the, the networks uh, rise themselves so quickly that uh, the the van was surrounded. It was very peaceful. There was a f an eight hour standoff. There was mediation between activists. Am Amar Anwar was there as the lawyer. And the woman who I think read out this sort of declaration of Kenmuir Street uh, was Pinar Aksu, who herself had come here as a refugee. She now works with the Maryhill Integration Network. 
And, um, you know, so she was was a very kind of central part to all of that, too. So anyway, I managed to speak to someone who I decided not to name because this was what was, was so surprising. This was a fairly confident, you know, out there um, campaigner who said uh, about the atmosphere there was last Wednesday after all that was happening and particularly the burning of a hotel with with asylum seekers inside it in Rotherham. Um, she said, I've never felt this way before. Friends are asking if it's even safe, safe to leave the house. This is someone in Glasgow. People are making comments to our face faces. They feel bolder now. We're telling children how to act if they are threatened. We must think about not provoking racists. Uh, and she, she says, I just couldn't get over that people could set a hotel on fire. They could come and target asylum seeker hotels here. They have the names. And if we turn up in George Square, they could target us. Um, she pointed out we also have to get there and get home safely. So actually, we might not turn up. But and this is the key point. We do need people there from other backgrounds. I would feel terrible if racists were able to walk Glasgow streets freely. Now, wouldn't you? So that's the point. I, I think a lot of people I've had this conversation quite a number of different places uh, over the last week. And. There's a lot of people who also feel kind of, well, disappointed with Hamza Youssef that he says he might even leave Scotland because it feels like a sort of slight on Scotland when we think nothing's actually happened here. But what he's saying and what she's saying, and I think what lots of other people would be saying, is that you you don't, you know, you live in fear of something happening as imminently and you're also getting snashed the whole time. Low level snash maybe or high level snatch that you don't see, you know, the rest of us don't see. So I think that article still stands. I mean, I'll be going on September the 7th um, and solidarity really matters because it's actually part of the sort of philosophy in a sense of what is citizenship in Scotland. We've defined it, we defined it at the Indy Ref as anyone who's lived here for three months. That That's basically, if you're here, you're in. And that is contrast completely with what was defined for the Brexit referendum. It was ethnic. It was British, Irish, Commonwealth citizens, hundreds of thousands of people who could have lived here their entire lives, but not born here, couldn't vote. So, you know, that's how we defined ourselves. Now we need to stand up for that definition because that's how we see citizenship. And I think that's really important. Yeah, because uh, and that's exactly what George Kerbin was saying. In fact, he makes an explicit connection between the development of Scottish civic nationalism. And I know that's going to be a red rag to a bull to some people say, oh, nationalism is nationalism is nationalism and it's all wrong. But Scottish civic nationalism has defined itself, particularly according to George, since the 1960s. And I recognise very much this very much so in my own experience of joining the SNP when I was a fifth year old in 1967 was my dissatisfaction in that early age with the centrism of the what now looking back and it looks like a very socialist Labour government under under Harold Wilson and that redefinition of Scottish nationalism in the 1960s and the ability he says that one of the key aspects of it is we we should be re-emphasizing this nature of Scottish nationalism as radical as democratic as inclusive and as you said who could vote in the referendum you live here, you're a Scot. And he said the best antidote to the far right is a reaffirmation of winning Scottish independence and positing that, that Scottish future as an inclusive, progressive one. And he says we should be uniting around national solidarity. That national solidarity that shows itself up against centralised unionism. And he said that, that that these things seem to go together. And just on reflection about this, yes, of course, we have the far right in Scotland. And Ferret, the Ferret has done a, a tremendously interesting job in analysing these disparate groups that are realigning themselves around uh, the far right and loyalist uh, narratives and groups. I mean, and I go back to the, the football chance because, we are, as he said, we are not Simon Pure up here. I mean, we have had, uh, you know, the racism that existed and we don't need to go back uh, to, to statements that were made about the menace of the Irish race and all the same 
same same things that were being said about diminution of Scottish culture, uh, taking our jobs and placing uh, uh, rises in crime. This is the same old story as Paul Brady, the uh, the great Irish singer songwriter, wrote about. The same old story that's trotted out by every single migrant community. But I remember, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll censor this. I remember hearing at football matches. Uh, I'd rather be a insert racial slur here than a Tim being sung constantly at football matches, you know, and it's it's that kind of thing. It is there. But ha- there has been a significant development away from that kind of thinking in Scotland. And it is so glaringly obvious. And I tend to see the uh, the upsurge in these 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 groups and the orange marches and everything as the last throws of a dying beast in a new Scotland. And I may be I may be over optimistic in these in these aspects, but I genuinely believe that's what it is. We, as Josh says, we are not Simon Pure up here. We are different, not better, but we. I genuinely believe we are different. And uh, I think that I think the point he made, and I think it'd be interesting your perspective on it, is that the independence issue is directly tied into striking against the far right. Well, yes. And and actually in a different way, I think, than, you know, some people had been speculating. I mean, when part of the reason that I wrote that article last week was because there was a there was a lot of pushback on the on the and towards a nas- couple of national columns that were suggesting um, that, you know, that we should all get behind the um, stand up against racism event in Glasgow. Um, because, in fact, some people just said this is a this is a trap designed mm-hmm. to provoke a response that will make Scotland look like the rest of the UK, violent, divided, and actually unable to contain the far right. Now, just that, you know, I, I, can, I can see that people have got that concern, but really, I mean, what what is the idea of this country about if it isn't to protect every community? And what is the point of independence if you spot a potential threat and decide you want to keep your precious idea of independent, so squeaky clean that you're just not prepared to act. And the other thing is, just at a practical level, if even a few people go out to counter protest and they bloom and well, the media narrative is already written. Yes. So, you know, both sides are at it is going to be written. Whether I go into George Square, there's nobody there and I just blow my nose. I mean, hung for a blooming sheep as a lamb, as my mother would have said, although not in this context. So, it's kind of we can't keep independence as a nice, pristine project or actually <clears throat> live in the fear of small incidents or occasional bams that will let the media go off on one. Because this is just handing the whole of your identity across to um, uh, the mainstream media or to the to the bam. We have to. And the other thing is it it totally underestimates the general incredibly good self-discipline and self-organisation which I think is one of the reasons, the characteristics of, of Scotland. Um, I can remember writing a lot about this in Thrive. The number of, of kind of, and most of it from the origins of the socialist movements in Glasgow and the west of Scotland, but they're very well self-policed. I mean, all under one banner, have a tremendous record of self-organisation, stewarding and so on. Ditto the Tartan army, ditto the Palestine protests. I mean, you know, people will kind of make a big fuss about all these things. And yet tell me how many arrests there have been. So I'm not sounding complacent. And that's the key to it. Not being complacent, but planning, stewarding and having good communications. And that's why, although this feels a long way off September the 7th, anybody who was seriously trying to do something in George Square that day as a counter demonstration or whatever would be starting their proper planning now and that's where I hope people will, you know, consider joining that. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, I and think. And sorry, it, the other wee point was, mm-hmm. and getting over themselves, because I see that there was a bit of a spat going on about, you know, the, the, the trade union movement have, have also decided, well, that they're out with, um, with stand up against racism. Um, and there's then a bit of a feeling of, well, that's a Labour kind of gig. Oh, uh, you know, I saw. Yeah. That there was that tweet from Malcolm Chisholm. Malcolm Chisholm, suddenly that doesn't sound right. It is right, isn't it? Um, yes. And I mean, honestly, whatever. Uh, 
we can this you know we're, we're at a stage where we can we can actually act as a group or you know join whoever you feel most powerfully connected with there's you know there's going to be all under one banner stand up against racism trade unions there'll probably be some labor banners or whatever well fine because the point about independence is that there is a different settled will in the whole of Scotland not just in the yes section of it and the rest are all horrible the, the you know if you're going to have an independent country you need to have a vibe that actually d- it connects everybody and to me the strongest point the strongest case for Scottish independence is that right across the political spectrum there is a kind of care and an ability to act in defense of 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 powerless people which actually will be what takes us through into being an effective other country if we had a a, a huge divide and i hear people wanting to say yeah what about the two child cap what about this and that yeah i hear you but i mean if we had a country that had half the country basically like something like the national front we would never become independent it's because we've got a generalized outlook um, that even the blinking tories dip into they supported the scottish child payment um, that's strong. So let's not get all het up with who says what never. You know, let's just go where there's a need to be for solidarity. It's a Scottish thing. Let's do it. Absolutely. And I mean, just something that you said earlier, I'd like, I'd like to pick up on, Leslie, is just to, just to reflect on the fact that the, we see the foot soldiers, a, a stupid drunk woman who rolls a wheelie burning wheelie bin into police, not very dangerously. I think she gets three years in prison. But I note that people like uh, Douglas Murray, whom we've talked about on this this podcast before, and others, Lee Anderson, those who sit on the sidelines pouring the fuel on the flame and the mainstream media and people like the Daily Mail, the Daily Telegraph, etc., all rolling back now on things that they said previously, but who have created the fertile ground that legitimises the people taking these actions, whether or not they actually read these newspapers or not, but it's almost like the, I'm going to use that horrible word, the zeitgeist. You know, the zeitgeist is it's okay to pick to pick on Muslims. Yeah, let's be straightforward about it. And the 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 people that are being taken to prison are the foot soldiers, whereas the people who have fueled the frames are sitting there. I mean, I read this and it was uh, Douglas Murray writing, and as you said about the, the peaceful Gaza protests, Uh, If the army will not be sent in, then the public will have to sort this out themselves and uh, it will be very brutal. I don't want them to live there, here. I don't want them here. And that's Douglas Murray, who appears on Question Time, who is invited onto various various, uh, uh, mainstream television outlets to pontificate and give his perspectives. And that's the sort of thing that's coming from there. And Douglas, living in New York, will not go to the jail, will he? You know, it'll be these folk who are expressing what are often referred to, in a violent way, legitimate concerns about immigration. And I'm just still waiting to hear what these legitimate concerns about immigration are, Leslie. I mean, come on, let's articulate them. I saw Stephen Nolan uh, speaking to a a resident uh, of Sandy Row after a, a shop had been burned out, who kept saying he wasn't a racist, but he just didn't want black and brown people living near him or having shops. So what are these legitimate concerns about immigration? To me, the legitimate concerns are poverty, lack of employment, uh, the degeneration of public services through lack of investment. Now, let's talk about that. But the moment it gets in there that we should have a debate about legitimate concerns about immigration, you've already accepted the fact that migration is a problem. And people from different ethnic backgrounds and cultures coming here, that's a problem. Rather than focusing on what the genuine problems are from my perspective when you drill down into it, which is those points that I raised just a few moments ago. Yep, absolutely. Rant, rant, yep. rant. I think rant. I can't remember if I did. I ranted last week about how all of that was exactly underlying the the event in two thousand and one when I was still working for the BBC, yes. where Fairzit Dag was stabbed, um, and and Sight Hill had basically when we turned up in the you know, in the luxury camper van to do a, a live broadcast, um, the, the the people there said, "You've never come here before." Yeah. So, yeah. you know, there's definitely a whole lot in there that that's there for, you know, the manipulation. 
And boy, does it get manipulated. Are we talking about Elon Musk or are you going oh, somewhere else? Oh, no, no. That that was that that particular person I was about to come on to, because, I mean, you talk about a target on the back, because literally that's what Musk has done with Hamza Youssef, describing him as a scumbag, daring him to sue him, calling him a super, super racist. And this is a, this is a pretty chilling thing. I mean, God, racism aside, am I daring to say that? Yeah. Legal discovery will show that however big a racist he's been in public communications, he is vastly worse than private communications. So that would appear that Elon Musk, who owns X and Twitter, is about to uh, make public what he claims to be, you know, what he's got in his back pocket about private communications and messages that uh, Hamza Youssef has said which should send a chilling message to everyone about the influence that Elon Musk actually has. And this is the bit there. I dare that scumbag to sue me. And this is the bit. Go ahead, make my day. So there we have it, quoting Dirty Harry, you know, with the Magnum 45 in his hand, you know, at the end of Dirty Harry, go on, punk, make my day. And this is the fantasy world that these so-called alpha males self-described alpha males like Elon Musk and Donald Trump inhabit. So that's there. I mean, it's an absolutely appalling situation because Hamza Yusuf went on, I think uh, he was on a fringe event, and they went on CNN, which is the one that attracted Musk's attention, to saying that Musk had amplified white supremacists, that civil war was inevitable, and uh, he called him a dangerous race. Uh, and in case anyone misunderstands that, I'm sure they wouldn't. But it's not that Hamza was saying no. that civil war is inevitable. That was one of Elon Musk's. Yeah, yeah. and he and uh, he said and he was wrong. Actually, and he was wrong. I mean, just yes. proved wrong the very same day. It's always yeah. worth this. I mean, I know that the far right don't get expunged from everything, but the amount of people nursing their fear to keep it warm that goes on, you know, it, it's like it just factually didn't happen. But anyway, I interrupt. No, no, no. I was just about to say he called uh, Musk a dangerous race beta. And that seems to have ex- exercised uh, Musk enormously. And he's coming out with these inflammatory statements. And I, I'd be very interested because what happened was that Hamza Yusuf's legal team turned around and said, well, keep on saying these sort of things and we're going we're gonna to do you for libel. So we shall see what happens there. But but the, the next thing about Musk and I, I, well, I don't... Well, before you go yeah, on to oh, that, please. though, I mean, actually, there's, there's, a, there's a really... There's an, a big debate now then about whether or not people should leave Twitter, mm. um, which which actually Neil Mackay's written an interesting piece about uh, in today's Herald. It's just in there, uh, and he's you know he he summarises essentially Musk's kind of almost cri- crimes against humanity. I mean I don't know if anyone's remembering that before he even bought Twitter, there was a British caver who helped rescue oh, God, some yeah. trapped Thai schoolboys, and he called him a pedo. You know, it's just uh, unbelievable. He pushed this conspiracy theory about the hammer attack on Nancy Pelosi's husband, you know, and that was all, you know, so he's been kind of revving up. And and Neil Mackay, who obviously looks like he's cruising for some sort of attention on Twitter, um, has, has basically called him, you know, the Frankenstein of the 21st century. But he's not leaving Twitter. And he's kind of make you know, it, it's an interesting argument because he's kind of saying Twitter is uh, journalism is part of the attention economy and that he says I need to tell the public I've written something so they'll come to the website and read it if I don't I drastically reduce the number of possible readers now I'm sure you know I'm, I'm pretty much in the same position and given that the if you like the independence cohort or you know yesers uh, I think are probably disproportionate users of social mm. media because for long enough they were completely excluded from the media and, in fact, still are, you know, apart from the national. So that alternative means of communicating are pretty much something that a lot of yesers would use. And I, I really don't know what the best thing to do is. I can't remember what I've got, something like 90,000 followers on Twitter. It's quite useful for for lots of people, because if anybody wants me to put something out that gets a bit of, you know, gets <clears throat> a bit of attention or traction, there it is. Um, but anyway, he wants to see Twi- Musk's Twitter ruined. He says, I want to see the building he set a light burn to the ground. And he thinks that Musk won't see this out for very long. I, d- I don't know, you know, actually. And I'd be interested to know what people people make of that part of it. 
Yeah, because, I mean, it's, what Musk has successfully done is he, he sacked, I think, as I said last week, I think about three quarters of the staff. The profits are plummeting, but he's using it as a platform, again, just to to promulgate his his changing perspectives or were these perspectives there already you know because he was a biden supporter back when uh, joe biden ran uh for in the uh, last presidential election i think he contributed to the biden campaign he was a he, he attacked uh donald trump for withdrawing from the paris accords and you thought oh good guy no what actually he was concerned about was sale of electric vehicles because and trump was very anti-electric vehicles until suddenly and this is the mark of the man trump uh, he gets $45 million a month in donations through a, one of these packs uh, to to his campaign. And he says, well, no, I've changed my mind on electrical vehicles. Uh, look how much money Elon Musk has given me, which should be a warning sign to anybody. I mean, if you pay Donald Trump enough, he's going to change his perspectives. But it is a vanity project and a promulgation of, as I say, of, of Musk's perspectives on the world. And he feels... That that's his platform for, but for then, putting all this stuff again, out. But then again, you know, on this question of of what to do about him, and I know we're going on to this ludicrous interview he did with Donald Trump, which yeah. you weirdly listened to part of. Oh god! But just yeah. you know, the final point is: so do people avoid Tesla? You know, I yes. mean, because that is the, yeah. that's the money maker. Twitter's not. Mm-hmm. And and when you begin to look, I've got a friend who's looking at getting a an electric car. I mean, I know everybody. Yeah, they're very expensive Teslas, but when you start to look at what, you know, long term bang for bucks, um, I know people have got them. And they also are providing a system now where you if you've got um, any kind of kit on your house, if you've Mm -hmm. got solar panels or whatever, if you're producing electricity, they've got a battery that allows you to essentially just whip that straight off into charging your Tesla. So for a lot of people who are sort of trying to think ahead and have got the money Tesla are beginning to corner that market already. You know, the sort of, if you like, you know, the same way that, and uh, we were talking about this earlier when I had a little bit of um, problem with IT <laughs> equipment, yes. you know, when stuff only speaks to its own brand. And that that's there too. So uh, it's going to be very difficult. The Twitter thing is part of it. And it's obviously the, the kind of freedom of speech thing is the world kind of cafe that this was meant to be is just not. Uh, but equally, and nuts and bolts, that's a kind of you know, should be a huge worry that he his firm has now got such a grip on on what the future might be for okay, admittedly those who've got the cash at the moment. Anyway, yeah. so this weird this weird oh. kind of interview. Yeah, well, interview. I mean, of, of such. I mean, I, I heard it described as was this the first time in his life that. Uh, Elon Musk had actually spoken to another human being. I mean, and that was, I mean, the other human being he chose to speak to was uh, was the Donald. I just thought it started 45 minutes late. Uh, people aren't aware of this. And uh, Elon Musk claimed it was a, a DDoS cyber attack. And uh, experts have come back and said, ah, no, nah, it's just because your system didn't work. Because I think it was, was it Ron DeSantis? The same thing happened to him when he launched his because of the number of people that were watching. But it was bizarre stuff. But it's bizarre stuff, Leslie, within the framework of what's happened to Trump, particularly since the Kamala Harris uh, taking over the, as the Democratic nominee and it has doubled down since uh, the governor of Minnesota, Tim Walls, has stepped in as the, has been selected as the vice presidential uh, nominee of the Democratic Party, where you see the polls actually dropping right across the country on a national poll. And the national polls, of course, have got to be wary about, for those of you who remember the, the lengthy explanations, which we shall no go, go into again about the role of the Electoral College. So you've got these swing states, and in the swing states, Kamala Harris is now starting to lead. And even in Georgia, where Trump had a uh, couple of percent lead, it's now even Stephen. And Trump has been caught absolutely blindsided by this revival of the Democratic campaign under the the new uh, Harris-Waltz leadership. And he's retreated into this enclave down in Mar-a-Lago. And his stuff is becoming even more bizarre. I don't know if people are aware of the fact he's now making claims and it all goes back to donald he's now making claims about size of crowds and it's never reported on and he got bigger crowds for his for his speeches than martin luther king got for his and now coming up with these fantasies about 
AI constructing crowds, fake crowds, uh, to, to greet Harris and Walls when they arrive in places. So he's coming on this, he's come on this to try and you know, revive his campaign 45 minutes late. And just in terms of it, his speech was slurred. He was lisping. He sounded if he didn't have his falsers in. You know, it, that's that's a, it, <laughs> and when somebody spoke about this, this, I swear to God, I'm going to swear, was the official uh, Donald Trump uh, response to the, I, I, is he slurring? Uh, must be your shitty hearing. Get your ears tested. That was the official response from the campaign to the fact that Trump was slurring and lisping and he was going through all these that, the usual verbal com- convolutions. He did ask at one point, uh, do I get paid for this to Musk? Oof. Yeah, do I get paid for this? He, he he went on about the the cover of Time magazine, which was a drawing of Kamala Harris. She looks just like a a beautiful film star. In fact, she reminded me of that amazing first lady Melania. And you're thinking, well, anyway, he went off on that one. He talked about it was a coup that got rid of Joe Biden. That if they lost the election, he and Elon Musk should nip themselves down to Venezuela, because Venezuela was going to be freer than the United States of America under uh, the Democrats, that the true enemy, and we've seen this one before, the true enemies of the United States of America were not China and Russia, uh, and he's met with uh, all these people, and uh, he's met with the North Korean leader. He's a strong leader. He's a good guy. But it's the enemy within he was talking about there. Hey, God, ye gods. And then, he, he he went on about building the wall. He's fine with climate change. He says, you know, it's only going to be an eighth of an inch, and that's going to mean, you know, more ocean oceanfront properties, which is good for Donald. He praised Elon Musk, and this is and this is a serious point here. If people were listening to it, because Donald, the friend of the working man, turned around and said that uh, he would bring Elon Musk on board because Elon Musk is a great cutter. No, he cuts jobs and gets rid of the rid of flat. And one of the, and this is a, a, a thing, this is the one, the clincher with me. He banged on about people being released from mental institutions flocking into the United States of America. Now, he's done this time after time after time. And it's now getting to the point where, where people are saying, is he confusing asylum seekers with people who are in asylums? Because that seems to be the message. Of he course. continually focuses on people being released from mental institutions, and mm. is again, and that's 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 my summary of it. And if people want to listen to it, I mean, it's his greatest hits. I mean, but he's gone, he's floundering and he's flailing. I mean, he's trying all these these tricks that he's done before, and he's that he's referring to Kamala Harris as Kambala Harris, and. Uh, Barack Hussein Obama has come up again. I mean, and this Kambala thing is Kamala not 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 racial enough for him, you know. And it's the but point the thing is, you know, that, that's that is one side of it, and kind of so there is, you know, that this sort of hypnotic dreadfulness of Donald Trump and indeed, you know, Elon Musk. But the thing that's beautiful that's happened is. The sudden surge of support, you know, and we, we yep. can end up speaking far too much about the BAMs. And the beauty of this is I hope people have been following this. I've certainly been, you know, it's, it's kind of lifted me to see a lot of this. But even things like there's um, you know, there's a Republican who was at a Democratic event. Um, he's the mayor of a, of a city. Apologies. I've never heard of it. Mesa. His yes. name's John Giles. And he turned up to announce his support for the Harris Walls ticket. Um, Mesa is the third largest city in Arizona. I think that's one of those swing states, isn't it? Yes. Um, And so that was an amazing little bit of video to watch because he was quite funny. And he said, this isn't my normal gig, you know, (laughs) and he even got a bit of a roar from the crowd when he said, you know, that I'm a Republican. And you're thinking there's an amazing moment happening here, because just like I was saying before, it's when common cause starts to get, you know, created. And it gets to the end and he's basically saying that, you know, Donald Trump is a danger and an unelectable. He's hijacked the Republicans um, and he will absolutely be 100 percent supporting Kamala Harris and Tim Walz. And that's happening from loads of very prominent Republicans, which you never thought you would see. 
and which sacked, at, you know, in many ways, sadly, would not have happened if Joe Biden had continued. No. And so, you know, the, the, the other things, I mean, lots of people wondering uh, a bit about Tim Walsh, although, again, if you start looking a little bit at anything he, he says or d- does or his campaign videos, you kind of immediately think, right, this guy, um, I think Minnesota is not one of the swing states. So a lot of people had wondered why that choice was made. But I mean, there's a tremendous piece in on the Atlantic, which basically says it's, its headline is the normal appeal. So yes. th- this guy is, I, I mean, you know, I mean, one person had tweeted that he, he has both a cat and a dog and got them from shelters. <laughs> and for a lot of people, that's it. You know, it's just his <laughs> children were conceived with IVF. Another person who had a similar experience of the difficulty of having a child had a, has adopted children. And there's another link. And he says, th- this this writer says, the thing is that the Wolves family and my own never gave up, knew it would work out, and we gave our daughters the same name, Hope. Yeah. Now, you know, that might seem like a bit of whatever, but you start to, to, to kind of look at this. Minnesota that he's in charge of is, you know, to our terms, pretty liberal. Um, it's, a lot, it's legalized recreational marijuana. Um, it's offered protection for people seeking gender affirming health care. It allows undocumented immigrants to obtain a driver's license. You know, there's quite a number of things that, of course, then the Trump law will try to say this guy's like a crazy socialist or whatever. Um, But he's just a he's a great speaker. He's comfortable in his own skin. Um, And that might be useful because back, you know, we haven't I haven't yet heard a long speech from Kamala Harris. And that will doubtless occur in the Mm. convention that happens is it next week now? You know, it's coming soon anyway, a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, this, you know, this might be useful because he's definitely somebody who you feel can sort of mop up and the, you know, do the the, the public speaking and sound authentic and not, you know, whichever way you chuck this guy, he lands on his feet. There was some other, I mean, there's interesting speculation on, on why other candidates weren't mm-hmm. picked. Mark Kelly um, from Arizona. I spoke about, I think, a couple of podcasts yep. ago. Um, and he has this very solid background. But, you know, the analysis is that he's not an electrifying public speaker. Yeah. And so that kind of, yep, that could be it. There's another, the Pennsylvania governor, Josh Shapiro. I think a lot of people were surprised he wasn't chosen. And now I'm quoting this this article because, you know, this is touchy. Um, Shapiro would would carry quite a number of risks because the ticket would be black and Jewish. Yeah. And, you know, this writer is saying, you know, that's a bit of a lift in a country where racism and anti-Semitism remain real problems. You might wish America was different. um, But, you know, with that mix, it would fuel anti-Semites and other cooks who want to dirty the political waters. Um, You know, there would be all sorts of snash attracted to the whole campaign. It's very unfair. But he says a Jewish candidate could have ended up as a lightning rod for prejudice. Now, a lot of people will say, well, that's poor. Uh, but and who knows, you know, whether that was the, the kind of bid. I suppose some of the other comment is that looking, trying to get a Shapiro nomination, since Pennsylvania is one of those swing states, could look a bit cheap, you know, because we're just going, yeah. hey, we're going to get Pennsylvania in the bag. We're going to get that guy. Mm, that could have a bit of a sort of pushback. So this is all the stuff that's going into the choice. And from here on in, this is basically going to be a joyous kind of campaign, which is the other thing that is really quite astonishing about it. People using words like joy. They, they, if you just have a look, actually, if you haven't put it already, we can put the link in uh, to the launch video yeah. that they did with, with the incredible singing and Beyonce use, allowing the use of her song Freedom. You know, it's all about joy and positivity and what a blooming difference it makes. The money has rolled in for the backing, um, all sorts of nominations. And I, I did a wee tweet which just said, it, you know, essentially what a difference a day makes, but that all of that was always there. Yes. You know, it didn't sort of come from nowhere. The support, the money, the possibility of believing the different ethnicities who suddenly have found themselves back in politics they wanted to be, but they just weren't enabled by the previous candidate. And it, it, it is, it's like an upsurge moment 
just creates a different reality, which I think everybody has to take on board. And I did point out that is a bit of a challenge for everyone who's sitting with the idea that there is a, a sort of apathetic you know, group around them. And that includes the SNP. Now, you may have looked at the response to that tweet. Um, just because I value my mental health, I generally don't. Um, so, you know, I'm sure a lot of people took offence and said the, there is no apathy. But you know, ah, no, the the one I saw was uh, was uh, George Fawkes. I mean, he said, oh, "Are you suggesting?" And and I don't know if he got this that Kate Forbes should take over. Oh, you know, cool. and that was yeah. yeah mm. I mean, uh, yeah. So George picked up, and, and George was uh, yeah, in no uncertain terms, people told George just to you know be well, quiet. But, but that gets a bit much too, you know. So yeah, anyway, I know it's yeah. yeah I mean, I did, it's a shame that it all yeah. gets off like that, well, and and you know because it just. Every punch you take against somebody, you know, it just comes back to wacky. Yeah, so it was simply a question. Yeah. Is the leadership at the moment exciting enough to create a, a kind of centre, um, a kind of lodestone that that produces the sort of energy that I think is actually there amongst independent supporters and potentially more? And some people might say, oh, well, it's obviously not, but this is just a low period. You've got to see it out. There's an argument for that. Um, there is an argument that you need to create a different leadership team and you need to create something different at, at SNP HQ. You, you need to show that something has changed. Um, and it's not clear at all that any changes that are being made are substantial or are being communicated. And that's just not good enough, actually. Yeah, I mean, just a, just a quick thing on Josh Shapiro. Uh, one of the things that, that was actually said about why he wasn't selected is that Tim Walls is happy to be the number two, whereas Josh Shapiro is a star. So if you're looking to the future, that Josh Shapiro may be in the future, be someone who could have been, you know, overshadowed Kamala Harris. And the, that was the bit of the thinking that went on there. But if you actually take a look back into Tim Walls, all sorts of things on workers' rights, uh, LGBT rights, etc., as you said, and one of the key things about the uh, you, you know, people may not have picked up on about the fact of the IVF, that in certain states, questions are being raised about IVF uh, by people who call themselves pro-life. And that's the, one of the key things he wanted to say is that his daughter would not be there if it weren't for IVF. So he was defending that key statement he also made as well, which is that in our schools, we don't have the Ten Commandments, but we do have free breakfasts, universal free breakfasts, and universal free lunches. And I thought, the guy's got it. He absolutely does. Doesn't own yeah. a house. No one's got stocks and shares. But one of the things, again, to back to what you said about lessons that should be learned, I thought it was a very interesting article by Tommy Shepard in The National. And he focuses on what he calls the lost half a million voters in 2019 and 2024, who he says, by and large, have lost faith in the party and he said to deliver its on its central objective, independence, which he says is key and the lack of a viable strategy to win independence. And he comes up with four points that we can talk about that he says uh, should be taken on board in order to secure that majority. And I know you've had a look at the, the article as well, Leslie. What, would, what was your take on it? Now you've caught me because I did look at it when I was sitting outside uh, my friend's <laughs> house on Lismore, uh, which is an island off Oban, and sort of flicked through it and thought, mm, OK, and noticed quite a lot of annoyance in a lot of the comments because it is. I mean, Tommy actually pr proposed similar -ish stuff at the last November conference, um, which was to go into, which indeed I think they did go into the election with a, a mandate to get. Section 30 powers, but also control over minimum wage. Mm -hmm. I can't quite remember offhand the different yeah. things, the levers that would be pretty blooming useful to have at the moment, actually. Um, and so that was already the platform for the SNP. And there was a bit, a bit, you know, there was quite a lot of debate at the time because it wasn't clear if we now had a de facto situation or not happening with general election. I mean, it, you know, it was a dreadful result. Um, but so now looking forward, is that basically what's happening with 2026 that we're going into it with you know a, a series of of propositions yeah it, it didn't the, the criticism is it's just not about independence so it's not you know we're going into this election we're turning it into a de facto referendum and it's going to be about independence and it should be um it seems to me just at the moment uh i don't know if the snp's in a good position to do this kind of level of heavy lifting 
And I, you know, again, that was a dreadful result. I know a lot of people will say, OK, it was probably coming and there was lots of reasons and Westminster never works as well as it does. for It It worked pretty blooming well for quite a long time. And the, the, the thing I'm beginning to sort of fear, I can remember a point and forgive me if I've said this before, um, where people said of the Tories in their last awful year um, that basically nobody was listening to them anymore. You know, they, Rishi Sunak could just try as many rebrandings and different slogans and kind of, you know, whatever as he likes. But basically, people had just, you know, put on a mental dump button and they just decided they were going to vote Labour. And I worry that the SNP are getting to a something like a similar situation. And again, people might say a lot of the mainstream media stuff is to blame. There's a lot of stuff that's been achieved that's never particularly highlighted. There's a there is a preoccupation with ferries, although you try living on an island where mm -hmm. you don't have basically a you know the equivalent of a road out of it, and you find yourself quite sort of angry about it as well. But in in a sense, you can't. It's like the customer can't be wrong. You get to a stage with the electorate for wh whatever reason, if they're finding a sort of I don't think they're, they're in any way wooed over by Scottish Labour. Not at all. And actually, when we come back to all the, the kind of snatch that Hamza Yusuf's taken, and mostly oh, yeah. that is because of what is called the white speech, when he stood up and just made a long list of all the institutions that had white people at the head of it, and basically was making the point, there's no ethnic diversity in civic, you know, Sc Scotland or in Quango, Scotland or whatever. You've got to notice that some folk have actually found the same speech, yeah. essentially, made by Anna Sarwar, which has attracted not a, not a word. And that speech has been, the, the, the Hamza speech has been, you know, edited within an inch of its life to make it look as if he's basically saying there are just too many white people in Scotland, which anybody who saw it and knows him and whatever knows is absolute rubbish. Anyway, I'm not suggesting there's a warm and fuzzy about Scottish Labour because it's still not clear who they are, what they're up to. And, you know, British Labour will have all sorts of difficulties from here on in. But I, that still doesn't mean that people are automatically going, well, OK, we'll give these guys another go. It, it, I just get a feeling there's a disconnect. I mean, it's, it's obvious in the polling um, where people are beginning not to listen and it needs something big and substantial on a number of fronts and not another because we're so used to this you get a conference and you get a promise that was the Nicola Sturgeon method for about you know however many years it was nearly 10 years um, this needs to be a proper strategic approach and you only get that if you get a com change of command essentially at HQ and something that livens that up um, I just don't know that that's liable to happen so it's it's good that people are Tommy and co are trying to get their thinking caps on and get some sort of approach to things before the, the SNP conference. I see also that there's still a lot of people dissatisfied with how they think that conference will be held. But a lot depends on it, because if the jolt and the kind of animation is not going to be coming from the leadership, it has to come from the membership. And many people, I think, are writing that there has to be a kind of movement approach in all of this. Well, you know, I'm, I'm thinking through what I'll be saying at the September the 18th gig that um, Believe in Scotland have are putting on outside uh, outside the Scottish Parliament. So I'm kind of, yeah, I'm turning a lot of stuff over in my mind as to where we should be going with all of this. Um, but a lot of people who are, you know, radical movers and shakers behind the scenes quietly despair of the SNP at the moment. Well, the, the Tommy's four steps, which begins with a, an explanation strategy of there is no quick fix, no shortcuts to popular consent. Step one, highlight the constraints and limitations of devolution and how the power of independence removes them. Step two, campaign plan 2026, highlight achievements and demand for new powers, including a new Scotland Act. Uh, step three, it's the right of the Scottish people to decide their own future and remove the barriers to uh, the Scottish Parliament calling an independence referendum. And step four is to win 2026 based on this platform. My heart didn't beat any faster on that. And I know no, I that's no, it. yeah, that's and I mean it is it is the it is that. I mean and it, and, and I know I go on about it and uh, we I, I'm not a leader person, but I do think 
I do think people with the power to communicate and to reach out and to articulate what a Scotland could look like and to be that voice for it is vitally important. And to to actually energise people. So, yes, I'm not a believer in leaders, but I am in terms of their ability to harness the energy and to re-energise people. And I'm absolutely with you on it because I watched uh, it was Tim Walls. I thought he did the re-energising. He spoke, he's a union man, he's uh, for women's rights. And he, as, as Anthony Scaramucci, who I remember he only worked for Donald Trump, he worked for Donald Trump for a number of years, but he was the director of communications. He said he's a, he's a teacher, he was an inspirational teacher. He was a high school football mm. coach. And he's the guy, he's a gun owner, but believes in gun restraint. And he communicates in that way that comes across as one of us when he's speaking. He's got that power of communication, which is liquid gold in terms of politics. Absolutely is. And that's that's the aim, I think, of the ability to have the message and the messenger are absolutely correct. So we, yes, it's one that uh, I think- It is a difficult was, one because because it's also, I mean, this this is very probably unfair. I mean, you know, when you look at Joe Biden and he was he was making some comments, I can't can't remember about, maybe we'll be speaking about the situation in Iran, which is pretty desperate. But he was so slow. You know, now you've got used to seeing somebody speaking at a faster speed. It really is agonizing to watch Joe Biden. Um, and yet, you know, he was a decent guy. He he delegated a lot of the stuff that's being done in terms of, you know, the the investment in the green economy and so on. That's happened on his watch. Mm -hmm. Kamala Harris has grown, if she has done, under his wing, if you like, you know, so it's not that there's anything, it, and very probably the platform that they put forward is not really a million miles from a Joe Biden platform. No. It's just that you get to a stage where you, you can't see that because this feels old, you know, and I don't mean old in terms of years of age. I just mean it feels done. It feels tired, basically. And it's it's a ref, it gets associated with a person. I mean, that's why eventually people have to quit. Because it's not that they think they're bad people a lot of the time, but just that whatever it is becomes attached to them, their leadership. And the second somebody else comes in who's different, I mean, I couldn't believe the second Kamala Harris was in the role, how nobody was even looking to see how Joe Biden was doing anymore. No. You know, nobody was even, does, is he over COVID? Nobody was interested. The, suddenly the focus changed. And it changed, obviously, the, the kind of a person brings with them a demographic an ethnicity, a background, all that stuff. And suddenly those backgrounds get lots of coverage and energizing. And it's not fair. It's not fair. But anybody who, who you know, if there's somebody at the helm that people feel is, you know, Wheel Kent, probably very stabilizing, um, but has been around for what feels like a long time, they it's just almost impossible to inject a new energy. That's it's not fair, but that's it. Well, thinking about it's not fair, uh, we have the decision announced today of, yes, it's it's the very, uh, apt, well, is it aptly named? It's, yeah, it sounds very boring. Eastern Green Link 2, which is an energy transfer project, uh, going to take energy around the grid, uh, uh, which is going to run from Peterhead to Drax in Yorkshire. And we've got a similar West Coast link, which I didn't know existed. It's been up and running for seven years. And the BBC has announced that although this link can carry electricity in both directions, the majority is expected to flow out of Scotland. And Scotland is already a net exporter of energy and in particular green energy. So what it's going to do is subsea electrical connectors, which is going to transfer energy north to south. And uh, yes, and people are saying it's no fair. Well, it's no fair, but it was all, you know, that 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 was always coming you know that eventually when you got a government that understood something of the renewable potential of of scotland um they would start ticking the boxes that the tories you know had just spent ages because they were distracted into nuclear as labor is as well but i mean yeah this th there's a couple of things about this it, it does it absolutely will be scottish electricity going to england that's what it is just by the by drax which is at the other end of it 
which will be sending electricity up here sometimes, not very often, um, to compensate. It's kind of a it, it, it's at the moment, a, I think, a wood pellet burning um, mm -hmm. station so that it can be switched on. You know, that's kind of your base load. So a lot of our stuff is intermittent wind. Um, but actually, Drax has been named the, the biggest single polluter in Britain. So that's kind of mm, nice for mm. one thing. Um, th th of course, that's our energy going south. Uh, the, you know, I've spoken to a couple of people about this. And uh, there is the other point, because it feels like, wow, there's another reason that Britain will never let Scotland go. Yeah. Because actually... That hardware, on the other hand, is exactly what Scotland could use to sell our electricity come the day we're independent. So that actually, it's in a sense, it's not necessarily such a bad thing that there is kind of hardware in um, and paid for by the whole of Britain, should we say. Uh, there is, of course, hardware already across the North Sea where Norway pipes in quite a lot of, of, uh, of gas, actually. And that it doesn't do the Norwegians any harm, but clearly we're in that sort of sub subject category at the moment that it's basically just a removal of our capacity with almost no jobs attached to it other than, you know, the building the superhighway, most of which will be subsea. And this is the next thing, because lots of people that have not, I think, got much attention um, about their objections to the the same company, SSEN Transmission, the whole of that project um, is planning overhead power lines mm -hmm. from Angus to Caithness, and the bulk of that is overground. Now, there's people, I mean, almost everywhere along that route, um, there's, there's community groups who are trying to oppose this and demanding that it be undergrounded. And SSEN have spent quite a lot of time saying, oh, but it's extremely expensive and we couldn't do it, or subsea. So I've, I've already been in touch this morning with the company to say, why is it possible to subsea the, uh, mm -hmm. the cable down to England, but it's going to be overhead power lines when it's in Scotland across, you know, yeah. <laughs> pretty striking terrain. But it's the you know philosophy of it. There's a thing called the Murray Firth. You could could you not just pull that straight out there? So anyway. I'm sure there are people who know more about these things than myself, but it raises lots of questions about what is and isn't possible. Um, you've also got to say, you know, for all the islands who've waited for 30 years to get a small subsea connector, um, it is kind of, you know, it could be galling to see how quickly this all falls into place. But you, you do need to have better grid infrastructure um, across Scotland. And since that's not something that's controlled by the Scottish government, you, you can only be delivered by the grid, which is what's working with SSEN to, to put this stuff in. So I'll be trying to find out a bit more about this and probably write a column about it at some point. But, you know, it is it, it's a kind of reminder to everyone you stick in, even though it's a bit of a makey uppy Great British Energy. You stick in that there's I think the largest um, there was also pictures of the largest dam that's being created uh, for pump storage. There's lots of investment going in, but it's either the property of private companies, which indeed SSE is, um, or it's going to be invested in by taxpayers who will expect that to be repaid by the electricity ending up not in Scotland. So it's kind of a weird day. We should be all, you know, with this yes. level of, of, <laughs> of investment, people should be jumping around singing hallelujah. And yet it doesn't feel like that. No, because I, I, I think the, the, quotes from Claire Mack of Scottish Renewables is the telling one that struck at the heart of most of us who remember the uh, the oil boom and, and the, the massive benefits that brought to Scotland not. In the same way we've exported from the North Sea for the last four decades and beyond, the same thing is the case with renewables. So yeah, we exported all this and what was the benefit to Scotland? Cui bono. You know, we know how it was used, misused, and uh, uh, no benefit or limited benefit at all to the people of Scotland and to working people across the UK, to be perfectly frank, um, was, was derived from it. And it was utilised in terms of uh, the subsidising the, oh gosh, the neoliberal, let's privatise everything economy that was introduced under Thatcher and continued under Labour government after Labour government. So that's that one there. And it isn't fair. 
you know, two million houses. And when the, the next three come on board, apparently, it will be seven, 7.5 million homes entirely, entirely powered by renewable energy from Scotland into England. So there with us we go. still with the highest levels highest of fuel poverty, blah, blah. You know, yeah. there was, I wish I could remember which of the enlightened um, energy users, had, had energy companies had, had come up with a proposal which would actually um, have, which would really make energy practically, yeah, you know, cost nothing in Scotland. Um, and so there's not, no talk of that. Anyway, I wish I had all these things at my fingertips when this comes to light. Yes. But yes, that it's expectations. If everyone expects nothing, then you just shrug your shoulders and go, well, there you are. There are different ways of pricing this that work perfectly fairly, you know, to, to deliver cheaper energy to people close to the point where the energy is produced. And, you know, if I can't remember if it's Ovo Energy or which guy it is. But I mean, if these big old boys can actually roll out these proposals, I, you know, for, for example, I would suggest that the, the, the SNP Scottish government get behind one of them. You know, OK, yeah. you're, you're walking up a, into a brick brick wall in the sense of that's the kind of energy is controlled by the British government. But let's let's really back and sort of go for and talk about the alternative way of pricing so that everybody in Scotland could benefit and demand it. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So I've got nothing really to, to intellectual to add to this or even cultural other than the fact we went to see. Uh, we're, 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 yes. And I know this is going to turn a lot of people off. We're going back and we're watching the entire Spider-Man universe series of movies at uh, the cinema, which has been thoroughly enjoyable. Um, the, the other thing that occurred to me was the fact the Olympics are over and the discussion now appears to be that the Commonwealth Games might be returning to Glasgow in 2026. But the good news, with absolutely no cost apparently in terms of its funding to uh, the Scottish uh, Government or Glasgow Council, it will be entirely funded by the Commonwealth Games. So that's interesting. And it just it takes me back to when I attended um, in, in the last Commonwealth Games and my son and I got off the, the train to, to be greeted by these foam-fingered cheerleaders, you know, whipping the crowd up into enthusiasm. One got in my, my face very bad and started jumping up and down, hooray, 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 to which I said, Enfi Dundee, Edene Day organised enjoyment. You know, didn't, Pat. Come I on, did. even you're not that I miserable. did. Come I was on. that curmudgeonly. I swear to God, I did. And it was only it was only better by the day when we wandered into the boxing to see uh, the super heavyweight bout featuring Joe Joyce, who was boxing for England, but his dad's dad's Scottish. Uh, Joe Joyce, uh, who's going to have a pretty successful professional career, uh, degree in fine arts, male model, and and boxer. And uh, I'm sitting in there thinking, having been at the hockey. This is terribly dark. You know, how are they going to get TV pictures? And I said to my son, it's awful dark in here, Don. He goes, aye, if you took your sunglasses off, it might be a deal better. <laughs> so, so that was my... I was, and I thoroughly enjoyed the Commonwealth Games. It was a different feel. Uh, 2012 London Olympics, yeah, it was OK. But I, I really enjoyed the Commonwealth Games, a much goofier setup. And again, I'm not going to be curmudgeonly about it, and I might even engage in organised enjoyment if they do come to Glasgow in 2026. So, yeah. Well, when you're talking about dads, we've forgotten that um, Stephen Flynn's dad is is taking over as the as the new leader of Dundee Council. Um, I think he's it's annoying because well, I haven't got a subscription to Dundee Courier, which gives much more information about it. But um, yep, the, the 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 young chap who probably is not quite so young now, Alexander, who has just decided to stand yeah. down. I think he's done seven years or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, yep, Stephen Mark Flynn will be the majority SNP group leader. Um, and there was a you know as usual a characteristically sort of cheeky tweet from his uh, yes. from his bairn saying the old boy is doing no too bad. <laughs> Yeah, well, I noticed that the old boy has distinctly more hair than his son, which, of course, <laughs> I, which, I guess, leads me to the fact that, that when my grandson was laughing at me about my lack of hair, I said, uh, I, I said to him, my son was laughing, I said, well, you do get, and you do get this whole thing is that it comes from the maternal grandfather. So before you actually say anything, young Oscar, look at your maternal grandfather's hair, which is, oh, which is me. Oh, God. 
I got it all wrong. So Oscar was right to laugh at me here because I'm the maternal grandfather. So yes, that one rebounded on me totally, Leslie. So there you go. I just realised that live, speaking to people, I got that entirely wrong from my grandson. You know, this happens. (laughs) This happens, yes. So on that shocking note that Pat Joyce actually got something wrong, (laughs) we'll see you next week, (laughs) Johnson.